we're at Tallgrass Christian Camp, right, Bill? Yes, we are. Welcome to Tallgrass. Ah, tell us about Tallgrass Christian Camp. Tallgrass Christian Camp is the realization of a long-time dream. It started in the 70s, actually, when we were using leasing camps across northeast Kansas. And at the end of each camping session, we would talk about if we had our own camp, we would do this or we would do that. The things we would change about the camp. At about 1990, my father passed away and we inherited uh, 80 acres about four miles up the Dragoon Creek from here. It was a farm uh, situation with farm buildings and a cabin. We thought about converting that into a, a, a camp facility. Christian Camp Incorporated, we looked at it, we made plans. We just didn't really know how to get started. Fast forward to 1998, I was getting a part for my tractor, my Massey Ferguson. And I went into the dealer and he said, uh, I have some property for sale about a few miles from your uh, farm at Bradford. Do you have an interest in purchasing it? Our long-term goal was to build a Christian camp someday. And I thought, I'll take a look at it. I've got all the equipment. I can uh, develop the grass and so forth. It had been bid into the new CRP program. So I had, thought I had all the equipment to do that. So I came out and I took a look at the property. It didn't look the way it does today. Uh, 110 acres were in production, kind of weedy production at that, and the rest were woods. But I, when I looked at the woods and the potential of the property, I thought this would be perfect for a camp someday. And so I, uh, my wife and I decided to purchase the property and start establishing the uh, 110 acres of CRP native grass that you see out here today. About 2003, we were leasing a facility called Chihuahua, closer to Kansas City. And uh, as it turns out, Overland Park Church of Christ was considering purchasing that and developing a church camp there. And so we put this project on the back burner. I thought we'll partner with Overland Park uh, that, uh, with building or restoring the camp at Chihuahua. Cindy Pertel, Doug Pertel were the leaders of that group. And we met with them and Christian Camp Incorporated and we decided we wanted to do something. We put out on the table the possibility of partnering with Chihuahua or building a camp here from scratch at Tallgrass. That year, the uh, national meeting, which is uh, a, a national association of churches of Christ, uh, we took the question to Yamhill, Oregon, what would you do? Would you buy a camp that's already up and running, 37 acres, probably landlocked because of the buildings around it, uh, closer to Kansas City, nice lake, older buildings designed primarily for family camps, or would you start out fresh and build something like we have on the ground here at Tallgrass? Out of all of the camps that were represented at that meeting in Yamhill, Oregon, 100% of them said, start from scratch, be further away from the big cities, have plenty of room to develop in the future. And so uh, that's how it all got started in 2007. How much debt has been incurred building all this? This looks like a, a tremendous project. Actually, we have no debt. Uh, as we have had contributions, we've moved forward. And we've been moving forward at our pace using volunteers and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, there was always money in the bank to write the check uh, to pay the bill. We have about $800,000 invested. That's all money that's been contributed for Tallgrass Christian Camp. And the appraised value of the buildings that we've built with that $800,000 is about $1.5 million for insurance purposes. The building was 90% volunteer. About 10% was paid specialists for specialized electrical work and, and that sort of thing. Our salary is pretty limited. We have no salary. And so uh, there, we have no paid staff for that matter. Uh, we do pay uh, the people that mow the grass and we pay a lady that is our hostess that checks people in and out here at camp. 
Well, Bill, looking around in this big, big building, he had this big room. I noticed there's a, a wild animal back in the other corner. Is that is it safe to go back there? Uh, yes, it is. He guards the kitchen. That's Joe Bear. Where did, where did the bear come from? Actually, he's a gift of uh, Joe Walker, a member at Central Church of Christ in, in Topeka. He gave it to Tallgrass Christian Camp. So you mentioned about the kitchen. He's guarding the kitchen. Could we look at the kitchen? Let's, let's take a look in the kitchen. It's a commercial kitchen with your convection ovens, uh, all the preparation, the food delivery system through the window. Have a commercial dishwasher also. It washes your dishes and sanitizes them. So the food all comes in through the far end of the building from the loading dock. To the left is the pantry, and then we have freezers and refrigeration at the far end. This is Grandma's Porch. And uh, Grandma's Porch uh, is in remembrance of grandmothers that were spiritual leaders of various families. So our fundraising was to honor grandmothers. And uh, we built this actually in the wintertime. It faces to the southeast. So it's really pretty cozy working out here. So we worked all winter and uh, uh, had a good time building Grandma's Porch. This is Fred the Bell. We actually had a fella come from, from Bonner Springs with his big boom truck and put all of our roof trusses up. We spent all day putting the roof trusses up with his brand new truck. All the volunteers passed the hat and collected money so we could at least defray the cost of his fuel coming out to Tallgrass. He said, oh no, don't give me any money. He said, take that money and buy a bell and name it after me. His name was Fred. So this is Fred the Bell. Downstairs in the main building, we have two cabins that accommodate 24 boys on this side. And these two cabins are 24 more boys uh, cabins. The younger kids used to stay in the facility, the older kids outside. We're getting ready to uh, uh, build uh, another boys' cabin that should be completed in 2018. On this side are the girls' cabins. Likewise, inside the main lodge, we have another two cabins that account for 24, 24 more in the existing cabins. And 2017, we anticipate having this uh, last girls' cabin completed. And so uh, we'll have a uh, an array of cabins for boys and girls at that time. This is a basketball court. Sometimes you use it for volleyball. Sometimes you do set up the volleyball court here in the grassy area in front of the porch. This is a gaga pit. It's a form of dodgeball. This is nine square. Nine square is a game where you play with a ball about the size of a basketball, but much lighter and you play it by hitting it up through the top. The kids love the game. It's a great game. It's primarily designed for staff, for the kitchen work, Bible classes, and things like that. Some staff people bring their kids with them, and so we have a, an area where they can uh, play on the swings, teeter-totter, balance beam, that sort of thing. The entry point is what's called Trailblazers Camp. Trailblazers Camps are for kids from kindergarten through second grade. They come for two days and one night. So it's an introduction to Tallgrass Christian Camp. The next age level are the elementary children. The elementary children are from third grade through sixth grade. We have a camp for middle schoolers. They're seventh, eighth, and ninth. And we have the high school camp. The high school camp also uh, invites first year college students to come to that camp also. We also, Ionicomo has a camp that's multi-generational. It goes from uh, elementary through middle through high school all in the same week. So it's a combined camp. That is some tall grass there, Bill. Yes. Let's go stand in the front of it there and see how tall it is. It's head height, isn't it? <laughs> I'm six foot two and it's over my head by about two feet. Yeah.
What is this uh, seating area here? What, what is that called? This is the amphitheater. So they have devotionals down here and, yes. and activities? Yes. That looks like an old time oak tree. This is a burr oak tree. Estimated age is about 300 years. And so it was here before the white man came to settle. Let's take a look. Uh, I want to show you a Dragoon Creek. A Dragoon is a horse soldier. He, the, the river, the creek, is named Dragoon Creek because of Samuel Hunt. Samuel Hunt was a young soldier from Kentucky. In 1827, he was with a patrol uh, guarding the Santa Fe Trail, which is four miles south of here. And poor Samuel Hunt went into the water and drowned. Dragoon Creek zigzags all along the bottom edge of Tallgrass Christian Camp. Just across the waterway here, you can see there's some grass. There's six acres of native grass on that side of the, that belongs to tall grass also. They, they can access the water, they catch uh, crawdads and tadpoles and minnows and uh, enjoy nature on that hike. It's one of the favorite activities here at Tallgrass. Well, this environment is certainly a lot different from uh, the city, that's for sure. This is an Indian grass. Indian, Indian grass looks like a feather. Looks like a feather. And so uh, Indian grass uh, produces its seed later in the summer. Still uh -huh. considered a summer grass. It has a beauty all of its own, doesn't it? Yes. This is quite a structure, Bill. Thank what, you. What all you anticipated being used for? It looks like it's just almost brand new. Well, the thought is uh, for devotionals, rainy day activities, uh, crafts. Uh, of course, it's a hub for our water sports activity and that sort of thing. All of these stones came from an 1867 blacksmith shop in, uh, near Beloit, Kansas. You also have stones that have fossils in them. And so, uh, to me, that's God's fingerprints, that's man's fingerprints. Hey, this is one of my favorite places when a camp is going. Sit here and watch the kids play games and, and so forth. Uh, you're right in the middle of the hub of activity here. What this site reminds me mostly of is when we did the uh, groundbreaking. We auctioned off a hat that had Tallgrass Christian Camp on it. And I, I remember uh, uh, John De Leon bidding $500 for a ball cap. And to that point, that was the biggest contribution we had received, was $500. It certainly mushroomed from that uh, first auctioning of a, of a ball cap. There's been a lot of people have uh, donated and time and money and, Tremendous. and prayed. More than, more than you can count. I know, I know. This is, uh, it turned out to be a much, much bigger thing than I ever envisioned, that's for sure. It's quiet out here now, but isn't it a blessing to hear the kids' voices when they come out of the building? It's, uh, the guys that come out on Thursday to work, I always tell them, you know, this is just a barn until the camp gets here. When right. the kids arrive, it becomes a camp, and that's when it really comes alive. And I always encourage our volunteers to come out during a camp session so they can see the energy and the excitement here at Tallgrass. Well, it's been a dream come true for you and your wife. You mentioned that's her sure. several times. Diana has been an important part of this, this experience. And, and she's she's in. stood in the gap when I was directing camps and working out here. Uh, she's been in the office seeing patients, making the, the office run. And so it's been, I could, there's no way I could have done it without her, with lots of help, that's for sure. And she's taught girls Bible classes and been an active part in, in the camp experience as well for years here. She, and other she's been in a. Well assistant director uh, teaching and has a variety of roles. I'm on the board of directors and have been ever since we moved back to Kansas in 77. So that original was uh, Christian Camp Incorporated. Now this is Tallgrass Christian Camp. I mainly do operations. Other members of the board are more into the construction side. I do operations, which is like I order the patches for each year. I order the water bottles. 
I put on a seminar for uh, new renters to show those directors and other key personnel where all the switches are and how to make the water fountain run and how to run the steam table and things like that. I embroidered all the shirts and the, the bags that we sell. It's a fundraiser for the camp. Right. She also has a machine that does the I do not do that by hand, <laughs> that's for sure. Your camping experience started back in Indiana, is that right? Yes, sir. I went to um, Spring Mill Bible Camp when I was a kid. And back then, it was uh, Roy Van Tassel was Mr. Camp. And I feel like Bill Carriger is Tallgrass Mr. Camp right. for Kansas. Right. You mentioned sometime back you'd been a director for a few years. How many years were you a director? Well, I directed for about uh, 20 years in the elementary level. I loved it, but my hearing was not as good as it needed to be to hear the small voices. When we first started Tallgrass in 2007, I did direct two more years for middle school. Interestingly enough, I always avoided middle school because I thought they had too many problems. After directing them, I thought, these kids are really fun. I found them to be uh, uh, really a fun age group, so I wish I had caught on to that earlier. I got you. Well, there's, there's been some special events out here, as I understand. There have been a variety. We, th we think of it being a summer camp, but actually uh, we have air conditioning and heating, and so it's a year-round facility. We even use the uh, cabins out here for some of the winter activities, but the retreats, uh, we have weddings, we have uh, we had a funeral dinner, uh, you, we just a number of activities, and so the facility is used year-round. Well, it takes a village to raise a child. Yes, it does. But this tall grass has been an important part of that village in, the, in a lot of children's lives. Yes. Looks to me like since 2009, when the camp opened here, there's been several hundred kids come through here. Several hundred is correct. I, I wish I had a good number to give you, but I can't. I just know that it's... Uh, the camps have been exciting and full. Well, the legacy that you and uh, Diana have had, has your dream been fulfilled already? Well, Gary, um, when we bought this property and we were thinking about building a camp, we did not think we would ever see it in our lifetime, that we would will the property to, uh, back then it was Christian Camp Incorporated, and they would have the responsibility of building a camp and establishing the, the facility. But as things unfolded, this is what it turned out to be. Much grander and more uh, appealing than I ever envisioned. And this has been a lot more fun than just leaving something written in your will. It's been exciting to put your fingerprints on it, to work with the people, to work with the volunteers, uh, to see a dream unfold before your very eyes. That sounds like an emphatic yes. Yes. Let's yes. go inside and see that recreation area. Sure. Well, there's an interesting story about these beds. These four by eight beams had been ordered by mistake. They were supposed to be on the ceiling, but the design of our building didn't accommodate these beams on the ceiling. I was in a dilemma as to how to use the beams. I thought about making benches out of them. They'd be pretty heavy and bulky to, to do that. One Wednesday night at church, at, North, at uh, Central Church of Christ, uh, we had a visitor. He had just gotten out of prison and was at a halfway house in Topeka. He came to church at Central. And a fellow by the name of Gary Souter invited him to come out and work on the, the next Thursday with the Thursday guys. So he came out, we worked, he was a good worker. It was winter time, it was cold outside, so we were working inside the building. We stopped in the rec room in the, in the, at noon time to eat lunch, and I, I was sitting there talking to him, and we were looking at the pile of beams, and I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do with those. I think I might make benches out of them, but do you have any ideas? And he said, They'd make great bunk beds. I thought, you know, they would make great bunk beds. 
I never saw him again. I think it was a God sighting. I think he sent him to tell me, he gave me the message to make bunk beds out of the beams. <laughs> I think they're going to last a while. Yes, I hope so. Some friends of yours have indicated that you like to do things right. What is the story there? That's my, well, I have many flaws, but my major flaws, I'm a very particular. And uh, I'd like to see things done right the first time, not have to go back a second time to do it. Right. I think your friends appreciate that. They've been uh, very, very, very patient sometimes, but they realize it pays off to be patient because the quality, quality does matter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's go upstairs. There's one more story you haven't told. and I've, been... I've got to show you the plumbing. What this is, this is a tree, and each one of these water lines goes to a specific place in the building. Uh, that's a urinal, that's a stool, that's a conference area. And so we had a problem with one of the fixtures in the bathroom upstairs. I was able to come down and isolate that and shut it off. I shut off only that one instrument, so the water was maintained throughout the building while that one item could be repaired. So this tree basically divides the whole apparatus. Bill, there's one more question that uh, have had some requests for you to, to address. And I know you've told this story many times in the back of your tractor and, and the hay wagons and so forth, but it's the story of robber's roost. And uh, be it known on this uh, no, October the 18th, 2017, Bill Carragher is going to tell the story one more time of robber's roost. The kids always say that um, afterwards, say, is that a true story? I say, yeah, I absolutely that's a true legend, and it's a legend of Robber's Roost. As we had talked about earlier, four miles south of here is the Santa Fe Trail, and so trains would travel up and down the Santa Fe Trail. A train that was coming from the west would be carrying money, gold, Spanish gold, to make purchases in the States. And so an average train would be about 25 wagons to uh, 40 wagons usually, and would be carrying anywhere from $50,000 to seventy-five to maybe $100,000 to make purchases to take back and sell in Santa Fe. Well, that's a lot of money, but for what they would spend in St. Louis buying a load of shoes, they could sell for 10 times what they paid for it. And so there was a lot of risk with Indians, desperados, and that sort of thing. But there was a lot to be gained if you get your shoes back uh, to New Mexico. But in about 1842 or so, there was a band of desperados built a cabin close to Tallgrass here on George uh, Harvey's homestead, just on the other side of the tree line. And that cabin was a base for uh, the desperados to raid wagons that were coming from the west. They didn't care about them coming from the east because they what are you going to do with a load of shoes in the middle of the, of the great American desert? Not much demand. And so they would go across the creek up to Hodgson's property and sit on that high hill that was called Robber's Roost. From that high point, they could see uh, wagon dust coming from the west, or they could see the patrols of the soldiers that came up from down from uh, Leavenworth to patrol the road. They could pretty well keep their fingers on the pulse of what was happening on the trail by sitting on robber's roost up on top of that high hill. In about 1844, there was an American driver with 43 Mexican hands that drove the wagons. They had uh, uh, 40 plus wagons. They had 500 mules, which was a huge investment, and they were going to the east. They were going to make purchases to take back to New Mexico. They were camped at night on Log Chain Creek, not far from here. And the desperados from the cabin over here on the other side of the tree line raided the, the, the wagon train, killed uh, 27 of the Mexican drivers, 
stole the mules, and made off with a, with a box full of gold. That strong box was 18 inches long, 12 inches wide, and 8 inches tall. The gold disappeared, about $75,000 in gold. After the big shootout, the wagon master survived. He went up to the fort, got the cavalry. Took him about 48 hours to do that. Came back down again and tried to make sense of the whole situation. Every, they were all gone, of course. They buried the dead. They tried to follow the mules, but the mules went every, every which way. There was no way you were going to follow the mules. And so they worked their way west, thinking that maybe they had gone back to the west. When they got out in the west, they met an old trapper. The old trapper said, well, they can't take the mules back to Santa Fe. They'll recognize them. They can't take them on to St. Louis. They're expecting them. They probably are going to take them to Oregon. The Oregon Trail goes north of here, of course. So they cut off cross country up the Smoky Hill, trying to catch up with the Desperados. And they did. Right where Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado now converge, they, they caught up with uh, the Desperados. They had a big shootout. 18 of them were, 19 of them were killed. Two survived. They recovered the 500 mules but there was no gold. They didn't have the gold. The two that survived were tried in the federal uh, system and they were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in jail in Illinois, Afton, Illinois. And that's where they spent the rest of their lives. But you know, after that period of time, there was rumor of lost gold in this area. 1860s, people would come out and look, but nobody found the gold. In the meantime, the railroad came through, and the town site of Harveyville moved to its present location. In 1895, an Englishman, an old Englishman, came to Harveyville. He preached on Sundays, in fact. But all the rest of the week, he fished down here on Dragoon Creek, at the mouth of Bachelor Creek, uh, just on the other side of the tree line here. He fished every day after about, oh, about three months or so, two or three months, he suddenly disappeared. He didn't say bye to anybody. He just took off. They thought, well, maybe he drowned. And so they scoured the banks of Dragoon Creek, could not find any trace of him. But when they went to the bluff that's up above Dragoon Creek, where the cemetery is now, at the bottom of that bluff are some big, flat, yellow rocks. And on one of the yellow rocks, a compass was drawn and an arrow was cut through that compass, uh, and it had a notation of 179 rods. A rod was a unit of measurement that was about 16 and a half feet long. And so they walked 179 rods, and they found a fresh dug hole. And at the bottom of that the hole was four feet deep. And at the bottom of that hole was a square indentation. It was 18 inches long, 12 inches wide, 8 inches high, and it was rusty. Some think that that was the box of gold that had been buried many years before and rusted, and he had taken it out and taken off with the money. So some things, people think that's the gold. Other people say that wasn't the gold, that it's still hidden out there. Now, I'm partly believing that that wasn't the true gold. The true gold is one that doesn't rust and doesn't go away. It's the love of Jesus Christ. And that's the gold that we have at Tallgrass Christian Camp. And that's what the children are exposed to. The true gold, something better than, than lost Spanish gold. <laughs>